So for those of you who do not know, uh, Gunther Roland is a professor of physics at MIT. He is the spokesperson of the S Phoenix uh, experiment, which as many of you know, is the last major experiment at RIC. Um, he's of course a member of Jetscape and also the CMS collaboration at the LHC. And if you needed further evidence that we are, this is a truly global event, while we are in the US, while most of the students are distributed around the world, Gunther is giving his talk from Taiwan, where I believe it's now 11, 15 at night. Well, it's uh, uh, so, uh, so quarter past midnight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's past midnight. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you so much for staying up this late. Um, well, right, I, I, I got up. <laughs> I got up three hours ago, uh, four hours ago. So it's not uh, that much of a hardship. I, I'm not sure which time zone I live in, at the moment. Okay. So it's a pleasure to. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Just just to interrupt you for one second more. Um, just to the students. The, again, same process. There is a separate channel that says experiment slash Roland uh, that you should ask your questions in. And, and Gunther, you have to give some indication to Julia so that she can stop and start the recording so that we don't have one large session, but a bunch of smaller sessions. Okay, I'll probably, I, I heard you, I will probably forget to do that. So uh, uh, if anybody wants to remind me in, in 20 minutes or so, then uh, that would be uh, appreciated. Um, okay. Am I ready to go? Yes. Go okay, ahead. great. So uh, my pleasure to give this uh, presentation. Um, um, I was really uh, surprised and uh, positively surprised by how many uh, people signed up for the summer school. So I think going online uh, has not only uh, disadvantages, of course, it would be nicer to be uh, in uh, in uh, uh, the room together with uh, everybody, but as we know, that's not advisable right now. And uh, as I said, the consequence is that uh, we have uh, many more people who get to enjoy the talks this uh, um, this week and next. Um, I see that we're not very strict uh, uh, about the time. If I had known that, I would have given uh, the uh, the first version of this talk, which had um, I think I started out with about 180 slides. Um, I have uh, cut that down by uh, uh, to about one third. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, the, I think the fact that, um, uh, that uh, you can have fill a sort of a, a, a talk that covers, uh, that I think takes uh, the whole morning with uh, just uh, a selection of interesting results show how, shows how far we have gotten in experiments uh, related to the, to the subject that we're studying in Jetscape, namely the interaction of uh, jets and uh, maybe other hard probes um, with uh, the quark lone plasma that is formed in heavy ion collisions. So it's a very broad topic. Um, I will try to give a broad overview, but uh, it's not a collection of all results that we have obtained in the last uh, 20 years. It's uh, sort of, um, uh, I'm trying to emphasize some of the um, uh, measurements, observables for which in uh, sort of recent years, we have made, really made progress on the experimental side. Um, you have already heard everything about uh, the theory of these, uh, um, of these interactions that uh, there is to know. So I will really focus on the experimental results and what the experiment, without too much uh, help from theory, already can, uh, can tell us uh, um, firsthand. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the big picture. And uh, on, the, um, on the experimental side, I mean, it's obviously important to keep in mind that we have been doing this uh, already uh, for about 20 years. So the first uh, jet physics results were uh, shown in, uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, suppression of uh, high PT, 4 GV production of hadrons by Phoenix uh, in, uh, uh, at uh, 2001 quark matter. And uh, then from there on, this has really exploded as one of the most uh, important subfields of uh, heavy ion physics. Um, but I mean, we have been at it for a long time. So obviously there must be a reason why we are still continuing this, this and we are, while we are planning to uh, uh, really uh, 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 expand these studies over the next uh, decade. And that is uh, discussed on uh, the next slide. Here, so from an experimental point of view, if we think about what do we want to achieve over the next decade, 
So if the, the uh, big picture there was really condensed into this quote from uh, the 2015 uh, long range plan for nuclear science that the US um, nuclear physics community puts together sort of every seven years or so. The last time uh, this process was uh, completed was uh, five years ago. And uh, regarding hot QCD, I mean, our field of, uh, of study, um, the, uh, there were two top priorities listed. One is uh, the um, beam energy scan that is uh, now being performed by STAR at Brookhaven. And the other was uh, this, uh, 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 is described by the statement quoted here, and that is to probe the inner workings of uh, quark gluon plasma by resolving its properties at shorter and shorter length scales. The complementarity of RIC and LHC is essential to this goal, as is a new jet detector at RIC uh, called S Phoenix. So, if one uh, takes this and translates it into a cartoon, um, the questions that we want to ask is uh, what is the scale dependent microscopic structure of uh, QGP? And what, if any, uh, um, is its quasi, quasi particle nature at uh, intermediate scales? And how does the uh, how do the properties of the QGP that we see at long wavelengths, where it is described by uh, hydrodynamics and uh, usually um, uh, called a perfect or near perfect liquid in, in colloquium talks, how do these properties, long wavelength properties, em uh, uh, e evolve in, in, uh, in scale from uh, the very short scale nature where we know that it is. Uh, that uh, uh, eventually if you probe at uh, high enough momenta and short enough distances, we'll be looking at interactions of uh, quasi-free uh, quarks and gluons. So how do we get from here to there as we evolve in, uh, in scale? And uh, multiple probes that uh, we can use for that, um, jets, heavy flavor, we can marry the, uh, vary the mass of the projectile uh, by looking at quarks, uh, gluons, uh, light quarks, heavy quarks, um, heavy quark, um, uh, probes and we can also use quarkonia for that um, today and within Jetscape we mostly focus on uh, the jet related probes to see what they can tell us about these questions uh, listed here and uh, what you will see is that uh, we have made a lot of progress on the experimental side and the theoretical side but uh, there's also a lot of work that remains over the next uh, 10 years to really make that connection and uh, hopefully uh, uh, many of the young participants today will be able to contribute to that uh, process. Okay, so as I said, the toolkit that we want to study today con uh, contains observables uh, based around jets. And in order of uh, appearance in the talk, uh, we can sort of classif classify them into uh, um, four broad categories. And uh, like many of the slides here, this is brought from uh, E. Chen, who is uh, one of the CMS uh, heavy ion physics co-conveners, a lecturer later in this week, um, and uh, generally uh, really one of the experts in uh, uh, jet physics. Um, so as I mentioned, it all started out with measurements uh, based on single hadrons in, in 2001. And we have uh, since then gone a, a, a long way. Um, for comparison, I mean, here this point is at uh, uh, close to 400 GeV, and uh, our statistical uh, our total uncertainty at 400 GeV today is comparable to the uncertainty that we had at 4 GeV uh, when we started out. So we have gotten a long way with this uh, leading hadron uh, measurements, and they have been sort of a workhorse in our field for many years. And that's essentially all I'm going to say about that. And the, the rest of the talk will really concern. Uh, um, um, observables where we start with uh, uh, reconstructed jets and then look at either the jet as a, as a single object, um, the constituents, the particles that make up the jet within uh, the jet cone, or uh, at the structure of the jet in terms of uh, its uh, uh, um, correlated subjet uh, components. Okay, so let's start out looking at uh, the full jet uh, observables. And uh, there, uh, we will be dealing with objects like this. And uh, you, you see that if you go to high enough uh, jet energy, it is uh, uh, very easy, easy to visualize um, what, uh, what we mean when we talk uh, about jets. We have these correlated clusters of energy sticking uh, out uh, very clearly above the background. 
And then, of course, the, the reason that we are interested in, in these is that uh, we believe that, uh, or we know that these jets are in many ways um, uh, reflections of the parton shower as it evolves uh, in the vacuum. When you look at the jet in proton proton collisions, or as it evolves in the quark gluon plasma, when you look at jets in heavy ion collisions. So there's a, a correspondence between these objects. However, it is uh, important to keep uh, a few things in mind when you look at results or when you think about this. First, a jet, while it's easy to, to, uh, to see it in, in this particular configuration, um, when we start doing analysis, the jet is really a construct, an algorithmic construct that with some accuracy reflects the momentum and angular structure of the parton shower, as well as the initial parton flavor charge and, and uh, uh, to some extent also the structure of the shower, but uh, these are not the, the, the same thing. Um, this is in particular, this is an algorithmic construct and going from one to the other, you have a, um, a variety of effects, effects, both irreducible ones from nature and uh, uh, difficult to reduce effects from experiment. In particular in nature, you have, as you just heard in, um, in uh, uh, Rainer's talk, you have uh, at the very end of the evolution of the parton shower, um, in a sense at the end, uh, the process of hadronization, which uh, in the context of what we are doing is a, is a lossy and noisy process. So it is going to be uh, um, impossible to get perfect information in the, about the parton shower, even if you had the most perfect detector um, possible. But of course, our detectors are not perfect. Um, and we have to take that into account. And then, of course, if you want to go this way, again, you have to understand your experiment, but you also have to employ um, models or theoretical calculations in going that way. Okay, so we have to keep that in mind uh, as we go along. Um, and then, of course, the questions that we want to, uh, uh, what we want to learn about the parton shower, how is it modified in the quark clone plasma? How are these modifications related to properties of the quark clone plasma, like, for example, the famous uh, Q hat and E hat uh, transport coefficients? But then, more importantly, at this point in the game, when we think back about, uh, 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 to the long range plan, uh, mission statement, we have to understand how are these modifications and how are the properties of the QGP related to its microscopic nature. And that is the, the big step forward that I think we are now slowly, uh, step by step, uh, approaching over the next years. And of course, the, the, as, as we know, and as you know better than I, um, the pattern shower is modified to various pro uh, through various processes, uh, some, which can be thought of in, in uh, some picture as energy, energy loss in quotes, uh, through radiative or elastic uh, uh, processes. Um, so that's hap what's happening on the pattern shower. And again, the question is, how is that reflected? How is what is going on uh, there? reflected in uh, the jets that we, uh, that we reconstruct in our detectors based on data and some algorithms. Um, how do we get from here to there and uh, what can we learn in the process of trying to extrapolate in the other direction? So it is again important to keep in mind that uh, these things are related, but the translation from one to the other is not uh, one to one. Um, and I mean, this is, a, I can't help myself from showing this plot from Gavin Salam again and again, which shows the, the same event. Um, I think this is an event, an event at the Tevatron in proton-antiproton collisions. Um, you get uh, the signal in your detector and you clearly see that there's some correlated particle emission. But uh, whether this is a, a four jet uh, event or a three jet event, um, it's not something that nature is telling you. It depends on the parameters and the algorithm that you use to uh, reconstruct the, the jets in this event. And so when you talk about what is happening in the event, you always have to specify um, with which algorithm and with, with which parameters uh, you reconstructed it. Um, and the common choice that, we're, that uh, I think we've all converged on both first in uh, in proton-proton collisions and then in heavy ion collisions is uh, uh, with the anti-KT algorithm developed by these gentlemen in uh, 2008 um, as, uh, as our main workhorse, not the only one, but that's, uh, uh, that's how we usually start out. 
Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful algorithm. It gives you jets that are sort of circular, uh, uh, makes them uh, easy to understand in, ex uh, in, in experiment. And uh, it is theoretically sound, it is fast. It, it was really a revolution. I think if you were part of the discussions in the experiments that were raging in uh, 2006, 2007 of which jet algorithms to use, and then saw how that was um, uh, resolved overnight when fast jet uh, appeared on the scene, um, that was really a, a thing of beauty, okay? But again, keep in mind, jets exist as uh, algorithmic uh, constructs. Now, one thing that is uh, really important to understand is that um, as we move to heavy ion collisions, we have to extend and amend that uh, algorithmic contract of what a jet in heavy ion collisions is. Because in heavy ion collisions, this jet sits on a very large uh, underlying event, uh, soft particle production uh, uh, in the event, or and uh, additional jets that are produced by independent part on part on hard part on part on collisions. And uh, um, what we need to do is we need to somehow subtract this underlying event to determine the jet energy and to determine, for example, or examine the jet uh, substructure. Um, and that, uh, uh, while we often uh, think of this as, uh, okay, we correct for the underlying event and then we're back to where we are in uh, in proton-proton collisions. Uh, this, uh, uh, as it turns out later, this is not, uh, not so easy. There are irreducible contributions from the underlying event. Um, I should mention that the actual discussion is a little bit more complicated because, uh, for example, in CMS, the jet energy correction in heavy ions doesn't correct to the jet energy at particle level, but to the jet energy in, at particle level, including the proton-proton underlying event, but getting rid of the heavy ion underlying event. But uh, that's really a, a detail that will not much concern us in the future. Um, why is this underlying event correction uh, uh, important? Well, I mean, this jet, uh, I think everybody uh, can find. Once you go to large radius, where you collect more of the underlying event quadratically as you increase uh, the, uh, the, this radius parameter, and to low uh, transverse momentum, where your jets don't stick out above the underlying event that much, you can uh, this picture from STAR uh, uh, immediately illustrates that life gets much harder for low PT jets and large radius. And you can see that uh, um, for central um, heavy ion collisions at the LHC, the fluctuations in the underlying event, which is what, uh, of course what makes life difficult, um, are on the order, are, are not much smaller, they're smaller, but not much smaller than the typical jet energies of say 100 GeV that we operate with. And of course we're trying to push the jet energy is down as much as possible because for some observers that uh, promises to give us better access to the physics. And then we run into this, um, um, uh, this uh, uh, background fluctuations. An average background doesn't bother us. What, bo what bothers us are the, are the fluctuations. And this is for I equals 0.5. Okay, so in this, the statistical process of subtract, uh, subtracting the underlying event, we typically in some form correct for a mean uh, area energy density of the underlying event. Um, we then unfold the contributions, uh, the distributions that we get for, the, for these uh, uh, fluctuations that we uh, get from uh, measurements and from simulations. And sometimes we do uh, constituent based corrections to be uh, to, uh, preserve as much as possible of the, um, or to recover as much as possible of the jet substructure in terms of constituents or in terms of uh, subjets um, from the contamination by the underlying event. But it, uh, jet by jet, there's an irre irreducible smearing of the information by the underlying event fluctuations. Okay. And this subtraction, as I said, becomes part of how you define the jet in heavy ions. So the operational definition of jets in, uh, in heavy ions assumes a separability of the, the jet and the uh, heavy ion underlying event. Um, the separability is trivially true when you look at high, uh, high pileup proton proton. They are the physics of the underlying uh, event and uh, the collision that you're interested in, they are, they are uncorrelated. So you can clearly separate those. In heavy ions, uh, from a physics point of view, that is not the case. What nature gives us are jets that are evolving in the medium. 
um, together with the, the processes that produce the underlying event. However, our algorithmic definition, in essence, looks at jets as sitting on top of the medium uh, when we subtract the underlying event. And sometimes that makes uh, thinking about what we're actually measuring a little bit more complicated. Okay, so that's uh, what I wanted to say about what a jet in a heavy ion collision is. And uh, once we have these jets, then we can start uh, answering questions. For example, we can uh, see how much of the energy of the jet is transported out of the cone uh, that we use to uh, define the jet. So if you take the same algorithm, uh, modulo the complication about the underlying event, apply it in uh, PP jets, and we look at the same jets after they have gone through uh, the quark gluon plasma, how much uh, uh, energy gets transported out of the cone um, in the in the in medium case. Um, of course, no energy gets lost and we don't violate energy conservation. So all that we, what we should really talk about is a, a out of cone, energy transport out of cone, rather energy, rather than energy loss. Um, and uh, that gives me an opportunity to uh, uh, show you this beautiful event display from uh, uh, CMS, where we see a jet um, here, um, maybe even a, a jet with some initial state or final state radiation, recoiling against uh, a C um, boson, uh, where, of course, at the, at the production, the, uh, the momentum of the C and the momentum of the uh, parton that then evolves uh, uh, balance each other to a good approximation. Again, uh, modulo some uh, initial and final state radiation effects. And we can uh, then, uh, we co did uh, collect a sample of such uh, events, and we can compare the, the sample for uh, by making the same uh, um, selection on the C bosons in terms of their transverse momentum in uh, PP collisions and heavy ion collisions. And importantly, what that allows us to do, which is not the case for most of the heavy ion obs jet observables, is, is it allows us to uh, compare the same population of initial parton momentum and uh, parton flavor in PP and uh, uh, lead lead in this case. Gunther? Yes. There are two questions about the fluctuations, which we should maybe address now. So, so, okay. so what, question one, is the fluctuation calculated with respect to jet energy or on, on average over all events? And the oh, other question is, what is the source of these UE fluctuations, algorithm or physics? Okay, so the, the, um, you have to um, uh, determine this. Uh, you have to determine the background that you subtract uh, for each event uh, separately. And uh, many ways uh, of doing that, one could fill uh, the one hour just talking about that. But uh, the key is that you use regions of the event uh, where the jet is not uh, to estimate the, the level of the uh, underlying event in that particular event. And then you, uh, uh, in, in some form, uh, based on that, estimate the underlying event level uh, where the jet is and uh, subtract it. Okay. And uh, the underlying event, it is, it is physics. It's, uh, these are all the other uh, uh, particles in the same event that uh, come from the hadronization of the quark gluon plasma. So it is physics. It is uh, the, the product of the hadronization of the medium. And as the jets interact with the medium, uh, as I said, this is, uh, is uh, not as easy as it uh, sounds um, initially. And uh, actually, maybe after this slide would be a good opportunity to uh, stop the recording and go to, uh, and then start uh, the next one. Okay, so here, let me just quickly point this out. So here we have the, the, the uh, momentum balance between the C and the jet in PP collisions for both the C jets and photon jets. So we can also use photons to tag the jet energy. And uh, then you have the, the same measurement for lead-lead uh, uh, collisions. So here the jets have gone through the quark gluon plasma. And you see that the momentum balance is shifted by some amount, meaning that some uh, energy of the jets has been transported out of cone. The jets are reconstructed with a lower energy and therefore the momentum balance shifts to the right. And just by this, without applying any, any models or, or theory, you can estimate that uh, on average, the jet energy in uh, these uh, central uh, uh, lead lead collisions, zero to 30% or zero to 10%, is reduced by about 10 to 15 percent. 
So 10 to 15% of the initial jet energy get transported out of the jet cone and are not reconstructed as part of the jet um, through the energy loss, through the modification of the parton shower in the coagulant plasma. And I should mention that these estimates are uh, and broadly consistent with, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, estimates from LHC based on hadron jet correlations and show an, an, a sensible trend compared to measurements at lower coagulant plasma densities at, uh, at RIC from STAR. So this is uh, roughly where we stand. And I think it's a good, good to keep that number in mind because uh, from the IA measurements, where IA gets suppressed to um, 0.2 or 0.5, Sometimes you get the impression that the jet quenching is this gigantic effect. Uh, on average, well, it is a big effect, 10 to 15 percent, but uh, it is um, uh, most of the jet energy uh, re remains within the jet cone. Okay. Um, so one I can also look the recording here, or yeah, let, let's uh, stop here. I don't know how long of a of a break that uh, implies. <laughs>